Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Moon. Our underwriter, High Energy Policy Corps, program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. We're really pleased to welcome our guest, Bill Cody, co founder of the Legacy Reef Foundation. And we had him on just before COVID started in 2020, because I was checking my records. So, like a week before it was discovered, you're on the show, uh, Bill. Um, and today we're going to be talking story again and updating uh, everybody on what's happening uh, with our coral reefs and with the Legacy uh, Reef Foundation. So welcome to the show, Bill. Thanks, Mitch. Always a pleasure to be here. Thanks much. And you have a great background there. I love it, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I went to your website in getting ready for the show. As I was telling you before the show started, and I, I saw the TED uh, presentation by Dr. Vaughn out of uh, of uh, Florida, yeah. and uh, I highly recommend everybody go to that and check it out because it really gives us hope. So I want to use that as my opening. Is really tell us about what's the current status of our coral reefs, Bill? You know why? Why you know why are we here, and what can we do about it? No, it's a great question. It's an important question. You know, uh, we've been we've been at this for about five or six years now, and we've seen a lot of good things, a lot of not so good things. But the one thing that we have seen is the coral seems to be hanging in there for the time being. Uh, one of the probably one of the biggest notes of interest that I have run across when COVID started, it, all the beach and water activity just ceased immediately. Within a few months of that, something that our divers found uh, was the coral immediately recovered. And we're not even sure exactly why, because there's not a lot of traffic out here relative to, say, to Honolulu. But without a doubt, the, the lack of human intervention and in, in, in use of the ocean made a huge difference in the marine life and the coral health. So once again, you know, we go back to if we're going to be in the water, which we will, we love the ocean, we all are here for the ocean, uh, we've got to be careful and we've got to treat the coral with kit gloves because if, uh, if it continues to degrade at the rate it's going, we're going to have major problems out here. Large areas of reef will die off and die off permanently. And that's a big concern of ours. We've seen this in Australia and other parts of the world. Uh, what, what people feel like, well, if coral... If coral dies off and there's 10 or 20 percent left, it will find a way to recover. The truth is, coral is actually intelligent enough to know if there isn't enough coral in an area to survive, it stops spawning. It may live, but it will stop reproducing. And usually that magic number is right around 30 percent. And we have areas in the state right now where we're really close to 30 percent. So there are some real concerns about it, but there are, there are things we can do to do all, all can do to help protect it. Yeah, that's one of the uh, things I really enjoyed about that presentation by Dr. Vaughn is what he's doing. And I, I guess uh, you guys have studied it and you're working with him, as I understand it, from our conversation before the show started. We, we, tell us uh, a little bit about how you're Yeah, we worked, we worked with him early on, consulted with him. Right now, uh, we're doing our own thing. He's doing his thing. Uh, but okay. we've certainly been involved with him. Susie's worked with him personally in Key West uh, a couple of years ago. But Certainly, he's, a, he's sort of the father of coral restoration. We have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, and he's a great guy to work with. He's a lot of fun. So why should we care about the coral reefs? I mean, what do they add to the world? Well, let's take Hawaii for, to start with. Uh, for one thing, coral reefs are the only reason that we are here. And as far as the tourists go, uh, we wouldn't have fish. People would be coming to Hawaii, and we would, we would not have white sand beaches. We would, not have, uh, we would not have the marine life that people enjoy when they're snorkeling. And a lot of the sea life that we, we bring home to the dinner table, that would go away as well. And those are real concerns of ours. As I mentioned earlier, we're not that far away from that, that collapse happening out here. And when it does, uh, the one thing that you'll find is that the coral reefs will start to disintegrate very quickly, which means we'll have an abundance of sand for five or 10 years, maybe longer, and then it will all start to disappear. And imagine this state without any sand. And in theory, in, in 10 or 15 years, 20 years, maybe at the outside, we could be looking at just rock, rock beaches, kind of like what we have in Kona, except all around the state. And that is a real concern because people come to Hawaii, tourists, uh, to enjoy our oceans, enjoy the, the snorkeling out here. That may not happen. If we don't have coral, we're not going to have the local marine life. And if we don't have the small local fish, we're not going to have the larger fish, which means when you want to go home and, and, and order your plate of sushi, or sashimi, you may not be able to get it, or it may be very, very expensive. So some real concerns uh, that we have out here with, with the condition of coral. So could you dive in a little bit into the technology that you're uh, using and, and, and are developing yourself as well 
to uh, restock or, or, or bring the uh, reefs back to life. How, how, what do you do and how does it work and what kind of results are you getting? Sure. Uh, when we opened up a Legacy Reef Foundation a few years ago, uh, we had a permit from the state to go out and, and do coral restoration work, or at least the, the research aspect of it. We did that for two years. And during that two years, one of the things we proved that one, that we could grow coral successfully in a closed environment, which we did. Uh, we also proved that we can use the community resources to take care of it. We realized that was important because we had opportunities in Fiji and Dominican Republic, other parts of the world. And we knew that if we had to send scientists out and only scientists, it may not be feasible, it may not survive. And what we found is we can actually train lay people out here in a matter of a couple of weeks of classes and then a few, few months of working with us. And ultimately our lab was run by, even though we did have a marine biologist, the lab was run by, by local volunteers very successfully. And we felt that was a real important point because you know, anybody can grow coral if you have the right the scientists and the right tanks and the right equipment. But if we take this to a, an outlying country like Fiji, if we don't have the local people buy in and their involvement, it's, it's probably gonna fail. But I think one of the biggest accomplishments that we did, and this was Suzanne's idea, which I think was a great one, is we realized that we could develop a program, teach the local people how to grow and maintain their own coral, and let them take it over, and we supervise it from a distance. So I think that was the most important thing we did. After two years, the permit ran out, and uh, we were no longer growing live coral. But the technology that we, uh, we've proven, thanks to Dr. Vaughn, we used that in Hawaii very successfully all the way to the point that literally on the last week that we had the coral in, in our office or our lab before we turned it over to, uh, to the Marine Biology Center in Hilo, is we got to watch what's very rare in captivity. We got to watch a spawning event with coral. And I can tell you, it's, uh, it's something that doesn't happen very often. It's very rare. And it was kind of a thank you that the coral gave us is, you know, you worked with us for a couple of years. We just wanted to say thank you. That's my read on it. Uh, but certainly we're very excited about it. And, uh, and certainly as, as we do more expansion work, uh, and restoration work around the world. We hope to take the same things that we used here and bring them to Fiji and the Dominican Republic and other areas of the world that need help. So tell us a little bit more about how you plan to expand your program. What, what's the actual plan? And what kind of resources do you need to have to be able to implement that plan? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, right now, we've uh, we switched gears a little bit from restoration to more education for the moment. Something we realize is we can, we can, now that we know we can do restor restorative work and plant out plant coral here in the state when, when and if the time comes and permits are allowed, um, without educating the local public on, on, on items that they need to know to protect the coral, all of the work we do could be for naught. So we realize that we need to teach people to use proper sunscreens that were in the water, make sure you don't stand or touch the coral, literally just a, a, putting your hand or a foot on a piece of coral. You can the whole coral head can die off of that. It just it can become diseased very quickly. So we with COVID and everything, we went from doing in in person training. We've had well over a thousand local people and students through, through our lab. It's been very successful, but of course COVID stopped all that. So now we're switching gears more into uh, the educational purposes. Uh, we're opening up a, a children's museum here in Kona, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, we're looking at doing uh, sites over on the East Coast from Florida up into uh, North Carolina, maybe up Maryland, uh, to educate people on things that they need to know to protect the reefs and protect the environment. Uh, so we're finding that's for us at this point in time, that's really a thrust of what we're doing. The restorative work will probably be back into, I would say, by the end of uh, 2023. Uh, we're looking at Dominican Republic and Fiji going back in there that we're walking slowly because until the pandemic allows us to be able to travel freely, my concern is that we, I don't wanna be half-baked and have everything shut down on us again. We're hopeful, uh, but I think it's still a year out before we do that. And as far as the resources uh, for us, it's gonna be looking for volunteers, for donations, and, and just other collaborators in different parts of the world. Uh, and unfortunately, Suzanne's efforts have brought in dozens, dozens of people from all over the world. So we do have a great network out there a very involved people that are really eager to help us into the next phase that we're going to be looking in the next year or two. So what kind of a budget do you need to run a program like this, Bill? I mean, I mean, this is, you know, you're traveling around the world, you've got to buy equipment, everything. Kind of what's the order of magnitude and, <laughs> and how much money do you need to raise? We're probably going to be looking for the next year, raising about half a million to $700,000 uh, to kind of sustain the efforts that we have now. Uh, as we grow, and hopefully we'll have a core restoration site in Fiji and one in Dominican in the next year, 
that prob that number will probably double to to be able to cover those 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 uh, operations. Uh, so you need some uh, you need some funding and the, and uh, so what kind of leadership uh, do you need? I mean, what kind of help do you need from a the state of Hawaii and uh, from other uh, organizations? I mean, what kind of people do you need to have help you uh, implement these programs? And what are kind of the barriers? Like, what what are the speed bumps that stop this from being really ramped up quickly? Sure. Um, obviously, financial is one because we're always, you know, working on fundraising, and that's uh, that's all, that's going to be an ongoing effort for us forever. Uh, finding talented people who are interested, other marine biologists that have an interest in coral, whether they're fresh out of school or have five or ten years behind them, uh, those are folks we like working with because they have enough knowledge to be curious and to you know to learn and how to to to, to the program. So certainly, we're always looking for folks that are talented in marine biology. Uh, as far as barriers, uh, when the time comes to do out planning it out here, uh, we'll have to work with the state and, and uh, get it re-permitted for that. And that, uh, for us, it may be a few years out. Okay. Now, fortunately for us in places like North Carolina, Florida, and other countries, uh, they're, they're working with open arms. They're very, very excited about our efforts. And uh, they've encouraged us to, to do what we can. And there's a lot of money out there for this sort of thing. So we're probably going to have a little more success a little faster out there. Things in Hawaii are taking a little bit of time, but that's that's how things work here. But this is our home base, and this is where I was born and raised. So I will be I will be plugging away at this as long as I'm here. So tell me a little bit more about permitting. I was surprised to hear that you actually require permitting. I mean, what what kind of elements or what what kind of things do have to be permitted? Well, uh, as as far as the state of Hawaii and the DLNR is that any if you're dealing with any marine life out here. Uh, you have to go through them. And then although the process is arduous, uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly endorse it because if it doesn't happen, it to anybody could go out there and cause problems. And they've had issues in the past where scientists thought, well, let's try this new seaweed, uh, particularly in Kaneohe Bay, it turned out to be a disaster and it's something they're still dealing with. So the fact that they're very conservative, uh, okay. I applaud them. I think it's important because we got to protect what we have. And so they are very cautious um, and we appreciate that. We really do. But as far as doing coral restoration work out here, there's a there's a few uh, firms that are talking about doing some nonprofits. Uh, we'll we'll be back at the game when the time comes, but it's probably like I said, probably a good year out. So um, in one of your slides, I see a lot of uh, nice looking equipment. I mean, is it complicated equipment? I mean, is it highly scientific, or um, is it is it stuff that you can make out of tubs and plastic pipes and things like that? Just no, it's, it's it actually a little bit of a feel for it. Mitch, it's a great question because the answer to the question is it can be. You know, Dr. Vaughn has a lot of very sophisticated equipment and we were very impressed with it. But something we realized very quickly is it, we needed to be able to design and build things that were pretty much off the shelf or in the military parlance, you know, cots, basically basic items that you couldn't get at a local hardware store. So when we built the lab down there, uh, we didn't really copy what David, what Dr. Vaughn did. We took what his ideas were, but we felt we had to source things that were readily available at a true value or an HPM. Because if we're in an, an island nation like the Dominican Republic, there's a lot of things they just don't have. So we used horse troughs. Uh, we used a great standard PVC irrigation piping. Uh, for the most part, everything that we got was something you could order on Amazon or pick up at a local store. Uh, and we felt that was really critical because if we design something that's too complicated, <clears throat> these people are going to get roadblocked and then the, the program could die. So that, anyways, the point is that the, the lab that we have, although it looks very sophisticated, I think it was, uh, most of those items could be bought and ordered into to wherever you are anywhere in the world. And what you see in this picture here, uh, we have regular aquarium glass tanks and we have special LED lights on there, which were tuned to the frequency uh, that coral likes as far as the, the, the type of light that they like. So that's what you see. It gives off this beautiful blue, blue hue. Uh, yeah. But again, they're, they're, there's just special grow lights that you use for aquariums, but they're available on places like Amazon. So the net of it is, it, it is not a lot of a complicated equipment. We, we just couldn't see doing that. We felt that would be an injustice to the people we're gonna work with. So everything that you saw down there was things that we bought at a, a local store, uh, donated to us, uh, or we ordered in from the outside. Great. Um, so. Uh... I'd like you to talk a little bit about your kids uh, program that you started up. So, sure. so I think you call it the Kids Museum. Tell well, us it's the, it's Hawaii Keiki uh, Museum, and it's basically a, a showcasing marine life 
uh, we're doing a large coral exhibit down there, not live coral, but basically the whole, you know, talk about all the things that we do. So we'll be front and center in the museum. And it's down at the, uh, the Kona International Marketplace down there. It's just going to be opening up officially, I think, in September. Still finishing up the details. In fact, we've got a big work party this weekend. If anybody's out there is interested, give us a call. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work down there. But uh, anyway, it's very exciting. It's about, uh, about 10, 15,000 square feet of space. Uh, it's going to be one of the largest museums of this type, in, in the, certainly in the state and possibly in the country. Um, so we're spending a lot of time on that. Uh, and the hope is that we, it's, it's designed for local kids and, and local adults. When we say it's a kid's museum, it's geared to children, but it's certainly the material and everything in there is, is very much apropos for, for adults like you and I. Uh, we're also going to be hoping to bring a lot of the tourists in. We feel it's super important. A tourist on an island, we're going to encourage all the hotels and the conventions in town to bring their guests down. It's a chance to teach them about uh, good coral health, good marine health, uh, when they're out in the water, what to do, to use the proper sunscreens, not step on the coral. And just, to, just how to live a little better life to protect the oceans that we all depend on. But anyway, that's the, the museum. And then certainly maybe we can talk about that a little more another time. Once it's opened up, we'd be real happy to share that with you. Now, I, I haven't flown for a long time, but we all have that little screen on the back of our, on the seat in front of us. Yeah. And uh, uh, really a, a wonderful opportunity for uh, public service announcements and all that kind of stuff. So have you guys been able, uh, are you aware of any program that we've started here in Hawaii to tell people, A, about the sunscreen, don't step on the coral, and uh, the programs that are being done in, in Hawaii that they may be able to uh, uh, support. Is that, is that, has that been done yet? You know, uh, before, the, before the epidemic, we were involved with something with HTA out here that was going to do just that. Uh, again, once everything happened, COVID, everything is kind of in sideline. I know there's individual efforts out there, and there may be some larger efforts I'm not aware of. Uh, but at this point in time, I, I don't think uh, there's anything substantial out there. And that is something we need to spearhead, at least Legacy Reef does, because we've got to make sure the tourists know about this before they touch down. And it, that's such a great point. So, uh, yes, we will be talking to HTA again about that and then also the airlines themselves to promote the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're now basically this is this is a one of the first state in the country that basically outlawed the, the inappropriate sunscreens, which real. Several new laws have been passed to make it more difficult to, to get the improper sunscreen. The net of it is that we're taking really big steps out here to protect the coral. And we want to make sure that tourists know that so they can take big steps. Our big concern is most tourists are going to buy their sunscreen, you know, at their, their local diamond their food store out there and bring it with them. They're not going to know any better. So you're absolutely right. We've got to catch them on the airplanes before they land and at the hotel. So that is that is something we'll be working on in the next few months. Great question. So I... I've been coming over to the Big Island a lot to support our hydrogen station over there. And I, I keep on trying to buy sunscreen at the airport, which is all is impossible. Like at the at the Kona airport, yeah. there is no sunscreen there. So why aren't we doing that? You know, like I don't know who runs the airport, but they need to get the word that uh, get some of their concessionaries to yeah. start uh, uh, promoting the right kind of sunscreen. Maybe there's an opportunity there for a Legacy Reef Foundation. To <laughs> well, there with the, I'll talk to Suzanne branding. about it, but yeah, no, there's definitely an opportunity there. Uh, and we, yeah, we, we, hopefully we've been spending more time with the, with the local convenience stores out here and the chains out here so they, they understand exactly what needs to happen. So it's, again, uh, that's, that's, a, that's an effort that we'll be working on in the next month, few months. So not to continue pinging on the sunscreen, but you know, Senator Gabbard did a great job in passing that legislation. But one of the fascinating things I found was that like one drop of this kind of sunscreen mm -hmm. in a swimming pool that's four times an Olympic swimming pool is enough to poison the coral. Can, can yeah. you comment on that? Yeah, it's um, it's amazing. You know, and one of, one of the challenges with the sunscreen thing, that there's, there's a lot of debate among scientists. Uh, some some buy into this, some don't. Uh, but the one thing that we do know is that this is the only country in the world, only major developed country that has allowed this to happen. It, it, it's illegal here in the in the EU and other parts of the world. It has never been legal. And so I look at that as, OK, I realize in our country we allow a lot of things to happen with the FDA that maybe we don't elsewhere. But if it's not happened anywhere else in the world, there's got to be some reason for it. And one of the things I look at is we know it's an endocrine disruptor. Meaning when it gets into your body, which, by the way, it does. So besides 
you know, you were heard in the coral. No, you see, you're correct. One drop can be detected throughout a, a huge, huge body of water. Now, if you're putting on several tablespoons on you and your children, and we know that those chemicals are being absorbed in your skin, we know that they can affect uh, your endocrine system. What is that doing to us? They don't know, but I don't want to find out. So my kids, my children, my grandchildren have never had that on. Uh, and I, I discourage people from using it, even in the mainland, you know, in the interior. It's just, uh, if it's not used anywhere else in the world, it shouldn't be used here either. That's my opinion. Right. Anyway. Now you've designed some special uh, swimming suits or, or uh, um, diving suits, right? That are reef friendly so that yeah. you basically are able to float kind of face down and see all the stuff without having to step on the coral. Yeah, so we endorse the product. Uh, we, we, yeah, we call them floaty wetsuits. Basically, it's a standard neoprene uh, wetsuit, but it has a, a small degree of flotation in the chest which allows you to flip, stay prone above the water. And we feel that's important because you're less likely to step on the coral. Uh, it's gonna keep you more comfortable when you're swimming. And, uh, and you don't need as much sunscreen, if any at all, just in your face and your hands. So yes, that's a product that we endorsed and uh, we still believe in. I think it's a, it's a great idea. So uh, I wanna circle back a little bit on uh, how quickly the uh, coral can reproduce. Like uh, I, I understand that it was just natural. It would take like 25 years for it to get to a certain size, but given the techniques that you guys are working on, yeah. um, what, what's, uh, to give us hope that you know, we can actually save the reef, yeah. I mean, how quickly can we actually propagate it if people, uh, organizations like yours uh, sure. are in there helping to seed, uh, I call it seeding the reef or, or yeah. propagating it? No, it's a great question. It's a very important question because a coral in Hawaii grows very, very slowly. Unlike the Caribbean, where coral can grow in just a matter of years to regenerate itself, a reef out here can take 10, 15, even 20 years to regenerate itself. And during that time, it's susceptible to, to storms and rain and all kinds of things. So we, we, you know, we kind of got short the, 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 the short end of the stick out here as far as being able to grow coral. What we did learn in the lab here in Hawaii is that we're able to grow coral substantially faster. Uh, by doing uh, uh, Dr. Vaughn's technique of fragmentation, we take small pieces of coral and then and chip them into little sizes, the size of your fingernail and your little pinky. And then we glue them on little uh, substrates, little rocks. We put them in those tanks that you saw and using light cycles and temperature and certain things, we've been able to grow reefs that probably within two years would take 20 years out in the wild. So wow. the answer to your question is technically it's, it's there. We've proven it with Hawaiian coral. We, we all knew we can do it in the Caribbean, but it's a different animal out here, literally. We had, we had quite a bit of success with the corals we worked with. So it can be done and it, and it will be done. I think there's gonna be a lot more effort. I, I believe the DLNR is very open to the idea of the restoration work. Uh, so we hope to see more of it out here. We certainly encourage it, whoever's doing it. Um, the big issue will be the people that get in the water. As you mentioned, the sunscreen, all the effort, we can spend millions of dollars out planting coral, but if it's damaged by uh, the issues that we have to do, which are sunscreen, walking on it, and of course there's runoff, and, the outfall and things like that. So there's a number of factors that we're trying to work with, but right now, uh, it, technically, it is very feasible. It's something that can happen, and we certainly want to be involved with that. Okay, that's great. Um, so uh, one of the questions I had was um, the uptake of carbon dioxide. So uh, do corals actually absorb carbon dioxide out of the seawater, and 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 that makes like the the coral rock the uh, that they, they live on eventually. Uh, what, what's their effect on the uh, absorption of carbon dioxide? Yeah, and again, I'm an engineer, not a scientist, but what I understand through our scientists, uh, the cor coral, which is calcium carbonate, basically takes in carbon dioxide and it sequesters it into the actual the body of the coral itself. So all these reefs out here are storing great deals of carbon dioxide which is great. The one concern I have is if they start to break apart and, and crumble, that carbon dioxide may be released. And also the ability to store more carbon dioxide is gonna, is gonna be affected. So right now, even though coral is being affected by um, high amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, if we lose the coral reefs, which we're the, we potentially could see happen, we're gonna lose the ability to sequester what's already in there and, uh, and then bring in more future, uh, future carbon dioxide. So we could see sort of a, a, a triple threat where high amounts of carbon dioxide raise the temperatures. We've seen that now, we're seeing record temperatures across the globe right now. If the coral starts dying off and giving off that CO2, it'll be re-released in the atmosphere. And unfortunately also will not be able to, to store it 
in the future. So the coral reefs are incredibly critical when you think of it that way. We've got to maintain them to, to protect what we have. And if we lose them, then we're going to lose that ability to, to uh, uptake all that carbon dioxide. And a great deal of the ocean's carbon dioxide uh, resides within the coral uh, shelves out here in the, around the world. So yeah, yeah keeping, it, keeping it going is important. Right. So uh, one final question, because we're, uh, we're getting down to the, the wire, is sure. uh, I thought I also heard in some of the stuff I've been reading that uh, coral actually uh, uh, breathes out and, and sends, it sends out oxygen. Is that correct? Do they help the oxygen in, in the atmosphere? It, it definitely does help the oxygen. It, it's, an, it's an important, as, as the trees do on land, coral does in the ocean. Uh, and I think anybody out there would never argue the fact that the rainforest and the South Americans and, and around the world are critical to, to our ecosystem. The coral is the same thing. So what the trees do for us in the rainforest, the coral does for us in the ocean. So that is correct. Okay, well, Bill, you know, we've uh, wa worked our way through 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I I'm going to give you one last uh, opportunity. Of, um, uh, if you can pull up the last slide, let us know how we can contact you and uh, how we can uh, 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 donate money. I mean, you're a 501c3. Does that mean you, I can get a tax deduction if I help you guys out? It certainly does, yes. Uh, so if you make a, a donation to our foundation, which we would greatly appreciate, it is a tax deduction. You'll be sent the form so you can file it with your next year's taxes. Uh, and certainly it would be a large help to us. Uh, we also appreciate in-kind donations. If you have a talent or a resource, something we can use, please give us a call. Uh, we're always open to ideas. As, as, as I said, we've got hundreds of volunteers all over the world that are helping us out. There's always room for another one. So, yeah, well, that's great. Good. I know a couple of candidates right off the top of my head. So, okay. I'll, uh, make... well, anyway, that's uh, that's going to be a wrap. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been very fortunate to be talking to Bill Coney of the Legacy Reef Foundation and what they're doing and making a healthier and sustainable cor uh, coral reefs. So uh, thank you for all the good work you're doing, Bill, and, and, and your foundation. And uh, thanks to all our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan, and in two weeks, we'll be back with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Hi. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.